Welcome to King Said So, Africa's one land, one language, one currency, one army on King Said So. Africans can unite your Pan-Africanist podcast. Enjoy. Arama Posa. Hike Shaliso. Amanda. Amanda. Viva ANC, viva. viva. Raw young lions, raw. Raw young lions, raw. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for this opportunity. I will keep quiet until I will stop talking until you keep you finish what you're doing. Once you're finished, then I will speak. I'm waiting for those others to finish their conference and then I will carry on. Once all the conferences are done, then I'll speak. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. Dibulele kakulukuni nonke. For Lele Tuba Loguti Din Mamele. I'll wait until they finish. I'm very patient. I will wait. I listened very carefully and I took copious notes of everything that you said. There were about 28 of you who stood up to speak. And I'd like to start by thanking you as the young people of our country to give your president this opportunity of listening to you. I really value it and I treasure this very special opportunity. It's not every president in the world who has an opportunity to listen to the young people of his or her own country. So tonight, I'd like to thank the leadership of the ANC here in the Western Cape the national leadership that's here, as well as the regional leadership of the ANC and the leadership of the ANC Youth League. I thank you. This is a very special opportunity for me. And that is why I am saying, those who are holding conferences amongst you, I will wait until you're finished. Because I want to give you respect I want to give you the recognition of being able, after listening to you, to reflect on some of the things that you were saying. I do this out of respect for you and to you as young people. Why do I do this? I do this because you are the future of this country. Without you, this country has no future. And I will continue to wait until those who are talking have finished. I can wait all night. You see, as many of you 
were respectfully coming to your micro the microphones. I couldn't hear what everybody was saying because there was a lot of noise. There was a lot of noise and I heard some of the things that were said. Now it's important for us to respect one another because without respect this country won't be able to move forward. When somebody stands up to speak by merely standing up they are demonstrating respect. That is how we were brought up. That when you speak you must stand up. And that is why I always say to young people when you greet people who are older than you you must stand up. Because that is how we were brought up. Not only brought up, but that is part of our culture. So as some of you were standing up, many of you did not respect them because you were not listening to what they were saying. And as a result of showing disrespect to them, I also did not hear everything that was being said. Respect is a very important value in a nation's value system. Whether a person is talking nonsense or not, you sit down and listen. And after doing so, you then can respond. I want to inculcate this in your consciousness, in your heads. Because as you grow up to be the leaders of this nation, it is important that you remember this important value. I respected you all by sitting down and listening very carefully to everything that you were saying. And I wrote down everything that I could hear. And it is for this reason that I will respond to those things that I heard. And once again, I do this out of respect. Because when you stand up as a young person, as a future leader of this country, I take it that even as you raise a complaint, you are making a proposal. And it's a proposal that I must heed. You don't have to come to the union buildings to come and sleep there, as your president was saying. He says they, he will organize you all. So he, my response to him, I said, I welcome that, because you will be safeguarding the union buildings if you ever do that. But putting that aside, many of you spoke about youth unemployment. And I want to appreciate your frustrations. I want to re appreciate sometimes your anger and I want to appreciate your hopelessness when it comes to youth unemployment. But I also want to say to you, this government is serious about addressing youth unemployment. We have identified jobs and I want you to divide this period into maybe two. What are we going to do about youth unemployment and what have we been doing in the recent period about youth unemployment? In our manifesto, we identified six things. Top of the list is unemployment, jobs. We have realized that jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs is the critical issue that is affecting the people of this country. And let me be clear, the majority of people who are not working are young people. But at the same time, there are many people 
35 and above, who are also not working. So we're focusing on both groups. And not only solely on young people, much as our focus is there, but we also say older people as well. So as we move to the next five years, we say we are going to be doing a whole number of things. Some of you say promises, 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 promises. What have you done? It's a good question to pose. It's a good question to pose, but it must be based on real information, on evidence. What is the evidence? When we got into power in 1994, there were only 8 million people who were working in South Africa. Only 8 in the formal economy. Today, there are 16.7 million people who are working, meaning that we have created 8.7 million jobs in this country over the period. So you know, creating a job, one job, full-time job for a long period costs quite a lot of money. And our reliance on creating jobs is largely on the private sector. The private sector controls 70% of our economy. And the government controls 30%. So the majority of jobs will be created by the private sector, whilst the public sector will also play its own role in creating jobs. While the private sector creates these jobs, it is actually enabled to do so by the public sector and by the government. We create that environment for them to create jobs. We are the ones who mobilize the world, the country, to invest in our economy. And we do take responsibility for that as well. So having created this 8.7 million jobs, we do believe that we can do more. We have the experience. We have the knowledge. And during COVID, we lost 2 million jobs because of COVID, an event that was unexpected that affected the whole world. Many companies closed. Many people lost their jobs. We have regained the jobs that we lost, and we created even slightly more jobs. Our economy is small. To have created two million jobs in a short space of two years is a phenomenal achievement for our economy. And those jobs are back. But we know to meet your aspirations, we have to create more jobs. And we've got to create them fast. So our jobs plan talks about creating 5 million jobs in the five, next five years. To create a, a million jobs a year is a huge achievement. Our economy over the years has only managed to create, even when we were growing at 5%, we only managed to create 600 or 700,000 jobs. That's what we were able to create. But now we are going to create a million jobs a year to get to that point. But put that aside, put that aside, what else are we going to do? We are going to train young people. We are deploying, as the president of the Youth League was saying, 21 billion rand to train young people yourselves. Now, until you finish the joy, 
I will keep quiet. Now, where are we going to get the money? That is what you should ask yourself. Where will the money to do all this come from? To train more than two million young people. And let me say this to you. And I know that a number of you who stood up to complain were saying, we've been to school, we've been to university, but we are not getting jobs. And that, in large measure, is true. What has tended to happen, and many of you can bear testimony to this, what has tended to happen in our country is that we have focused, and a few of you stood up to say so, we have focused our education beyond high school on young people going to universities. That has been like the Holy Grail. Even as I grew up, when I finished my matric, I wanted to go to university. Successful economies around the world have focused on getting young people to learn skills that are needed by their economy. They've learned the real hard skills that the economy needs. And we are beginning to see that shift happening. Because where young people or people have learned skills that are needed by their economy, they are able to find jobs. Because the economy, as it grows, and we are expecting our economy to grow, at a higher level than what it is doing now. They are able to find jobs, and I'll talk in a little while about where we want to take this economy. Because we want to take it to another level, new industries that are going to require new skills, that are going to require you not so much to go to university, but to go to colleges, to go to our Tivet colleges. I had the privilege today to go into the family of a lady who has two daughters. These two daughters stopped going, they finished their matric, then they went to college. And they didn't really have the money to finish. But what were they learning? One was learning to be an electrician. The other was learning to be a plumber. And she said, all I need now is to go to trade test school. And once I'm in a trade test school, I know that once I'm an artisan, I'll get a job. The other one said, once I'm an electrician, I know I will get a job. Now, I'm not saying everybody must be a plumber and artisan. An, uh, an electrician, a fitter, and a tanner, and all that. But I'm saying we need to now begin going to skills that are needed by our economy. And now these young people were saying, we know we will get jobs because we are going to be in a field where jobs are needed. In the past, young people have tended to go, to go and learn HR, to go and learn administration and so on. And they have often found that there are no great demands for those types of jobs. Now, I want young people to reorient themselves, to start saying, we want to go and learn the skills that this economy is now going to need as it goes forward. But what is it that we are doing for unemployment? We have set up a website. We call it Mobi, Mobi Youth or something. It's a government uh, as well as private sector set up website. When we started it, we said to young people, please register on this website if you are not employed. Today we've got four 
2.7 million young people registered. And when employers want people who should fill places in their firms, in their businesses, they go to that site. And I am informed that many young people are able to find work on that side. But beyond that, I set up the Presidential Employment Stimulus. And this we set up during COVID because we realized that we needed to respond to the unemployment challenge. And we set it up, and what did we do? We employed 1.2 million young people, gave them opportunities. You may say, well, those are not hardcore jobs. Yes, they are opportunities. 800,000 of them went into schools. We've got 25,000 schools in our country, and we distributed them into various schools. What did they go and do? Many of them went to schools to assist with schooling during COVID, and they got those opportunities over a year. But what that also gave them was the experience to work. And after that, they were then able to start getting jobs in a variety of places. We also set up the Youth Employment Service. And through the Youth Employment Service, we've now opened opportunities for about 100,000 young people. We also now have the Youth Employment, um, like it's, it's a youth service, they will tell me the name just now, where we are bringing in young people. Another one is called Narisec where we are building, bringing young people who are going to be trained by the Defense Force, not to be soldiers as such, but to get the discipline of work and be in a training situation. I will wait until you finish. I'm going to wait until I will wait for you. No, this is our lead. This is our lead. This is our Nishonipa. I will respect you so that you finish what you are doing. And then I will continue because I don't want to disrespect you. I don't want to disrespect you because you want to have the opportunity to speak. So I will stop so that you can continue. Then I'll continue when you finish. So when it comes to unemployment, we are setting out great opportunities for young people many opportunities that are formed by the government. And at the same time, we are encouraging private business. We have another program with the private sector where we subsidize the private sector to bring in young people into employment. So the opportunities that we have the opportunities that we are going to continue having, especially for young people, are increasing by the day because we don't want to leave our young people behind. And before even doing that, what this government has done, and when I go to rallies, I tell people this story. I say when President Nelson Mandela got into office and many of you were not there, he found that many young people were not attending school. Why were they not attending school? They were not attending school because schools required school fees and many families did not have money to send their children to school. In our communities, when your parents did not have money, it basically meant that you would not be educated. That's, it was the sum total of the black experience. 
And that is what Bantu education, apartheid education meant. No money, no schooling. That was your fate in life. And as a result, you will know that many of your grandparents and your great-grandparents were never educated. But many of the great-grandparents of white and believe you me, there are many who stand up and say, I am what I am. When I address parliament, open parliament this year, I spoke about Tinsualo. Many people started saying, no, we are not Tinsualos. But many stood up and said, President, today I'm a pilot. I fly a 747 from Cape Town to London because I am Dinswalo, because of what this government did for me. Some even say there's a young woman who, fly, who flies a fighter jet called a Gripon. A, fighter, a young woman who flies this fighter jet, which if we were ever to be at war, she would get into that jet and release a bomb that will go and shoot about 50 kilometers from where we are. She says, I fly this, I fly this jet right up to the skies. And she says, under apartheid, I would never have been able to do so. Now today she can, which shows that there has been change. Now, the other day we were talking to an aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineer, and this young man was saying, President, I'm able to dismantle the engine of a jumbo jet, a 474. I can dismantle it and put it together again because of what this government has done for me. And there are many such, and there are many others who have started their own businesses who are able to support their families and, 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 and. But there are many others who want to succeed as well. And some of you are sitting here. And we are saying, this government is your hope. We are your hope. And when you raise issues, we do listen. And when you want to form an NPO, as one of you said, yes, we will be able to say, come forward to this office and that office and where you can get assistance because we've set up assistant processes like that. One of you said there are no schools where I am, where we live. And we want to build more schools and we are going to build more schools. This is the government that has built more schools, more clinics, more hospitals than any other government there's ever been in South Africa. Because, yes, you can applaud that, because that is true. Now, now are there weaknesses? Yes, there are weaknesses. This young lady who's standing here, I didn't get your name, she spoke about the education statistics, the pills tests or survey. She speaks about it knowledgeably. And she says, our children do not read for meaning at grade four. And that is true to a large extent. Now, so you know, we entered this survey, this test in the world. We are only four countries on the African continent who participate in this. We compete with countries like the United States, Russia, England, Canada, and so forth, Australia, and all that. Countries that never had apartheid. Even the three other countries on our continent never had apartheid education. We've gone in, we're competing with them. The influence and the impact of apartheid persists even today. It is still there. It infected our education system so badly 
that it is going to take us some time to weed it out. What are the other weaknesses? Sports. A number of you stood up and said, there are no sports in our schools. That is true. And we are addressing that. And we are going to continue addressing precisely that. The other important area which the young lady here should have also reflected on is that we have started late with early childhood development. Many other countries, early childhood development crashes. When children have to go to crash, they start them at nine months. Nine months, the crash process starts. Other countries in the Nordic part of the world, they start them at four months. We have tended to start much later. And when you start an education much later, it's already too late. And many of you would have gotten into the education system a bit too late. Now we are starting, we are correcting what we should have done correctly now. Yes, we still have challenges when it comes to crime, when it comes to safety. Two young women stood up here and said, we don't feel safe. We fear that we will be raped, we will be murdered, and that is the reality. And there's gang violence, and one young woman stood up and said, my brother has joined gangs at 17. Yes, criminality has increased exponentially in our country. One of the weaknesses we had is that the ratio between population and police had gone out of kilter. And two years ago, we realized this. And I said in the State of the Nation address, we are going to employ more police so that we can have more police moving around in our country looking at the issue of criminality. And that is exactly what we are doing now. And we will continue to improve the criminal justice system to make sure that the people in South Africa feel safe. One of you spoke about gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is about the raping of women, the killing and the murder of women. And one of you said, it's better if the death penalty comes back. And of course, the Constitutional Court ruled that you cannot have the death penalty. And we are a country that is ruled by the rule of law. And a lot of debate continues about the death penalty, but the Constitutional Court, which is the highest decision-making court that resolves disputes in our country, ruled that, yes, there should not be death penalty because our Constitution says everybody has the right to life. But what is our response? How do we respond to gender-based violence? We have tightened the laws. We have tightened the laws to make it more difficult for rapists and murderers, particularly women murderers, to get bail and also made it much more difficult for them to escape from the clutches of the law. And we say life sentence must mean life sentence for those who rape and for those who murder women. And that is something that we are focusing on. And a number of you have spoken about, and I'm touching things that you have said, you said we must resolve the energy crisis. We are re re repairing or resolving the energy crisis. You will know as well as I do, the load shedding that we used to experience has tapered down. It is by no means over because for the longest time, we were not maintaining, ESCOM was not maintaining the power stations. And as a result, our power stations weakened, they kept breaking, and now they've adopted the correct approach to take out power stations, to switch them off. 
repair them. And having repaired them, bring them back. Because by so doing, we have more certainty. Rather than when it breaks, repair. When it breaks, repair. It is a process of repairing them and maintaining them properly. And as a result, load shedding is coming down and it is going to be a thing of the past. We are not the first and we are not the last country to have an energy crisis. The United States had an energy crisis for years in California. For years. They only resolved it recently. Now, what are we doing? We are now spreading more and more renewable energy, but that opportunity is opening up new avenues, new industries for us. We're now getting into hydrogen. Hydrogen, we, which we have in plenty resources in our country. We are now getting into the green energy. And that is what's going to require new skills. And that is why we say to our young people, we want you to be trained for the new skills, for the new sectors of the economy, so that you are well equipped. We want you to be trained for artificial intelligence. This morning I had a meeting with somebody who flew all the way from London to come and talk to me about this new, new sector of the economy that is going to drive economies of the world. And he was saying, South Africa should not be left behind. The young people of our country must be in the digital economy. They must be in artificial intelligence because that is what's going to drive economies around the world. That is where we want you to be. That is where I prefer you to say, I've passed my metric. I now want to go to college. I want to go and learn about the green, hydrogen, uh, the green economy, the hydrogen economy. I want to learn about the digital economy and artificial intelligence. Because when you get into those, that is when new opportunities open. Not only for you to be an employee, but also to be a job creator. Because I want some of you to be job creators. I want some of you to be rich, to be filthy rich, if you can say that. That's what we want for you. Because it is when you are that this country is going to move forward. And we're doing all this so that you can move ahead. Now, I know that we wanted to finish at 9 o'clock. And I'm finishing now so that Mdumiseni does not chase me out. You want libraries. You want to be in the creative arts. Those are areas that we will want to focus on and to have libraries and to create and to, to, to be in the creative arts. And in the end, many of the issues that you have raised are precisely issues that we are focusing on. And we are very fortunate to have an ANC Youth League which champions the interests of young people. Because it is the ANC Youth League that says to us, President, we are a country that is rich in mineral resources. Can we stop exporting rocks and soil and dust? Can we have them processed here so that we export finished products and we agree with the ANC Youth League. And we agree with you in the youth formations as you come forward to make a number of proposals to us. So that is why I was saying to you, I am glad that I have this opportunity. Not many presidents have this rare opportunity of listening to young people, of talking to young people. So I honor you. I thank you and I respect you for giving me this wonderful opportunity which does not come every day to many presidents of any country. Now all I'd like to say is that on the 29th it is you who must take the destiny of this country into your hands. 
this country is going to be taken forward by yourselves. And the one thing that you should not do, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Be confident and say this country belongs to us. We are going to shape the future of this country. That is what you should say. Now, I want you to stand on the shoulders. I was once a young person too. But I want you to stand on the shoulders of what generations of young people have done to take this country forward. In the 1940s, well, let me start off with 1912. In 1912, it was largely the younger people who saw that we needed to change and set up a movement like the African National Congress. People like Pixlika Isakaseme were still young. People who were still younger in thought and in education and action are the ones who helped to set up the ANC. And in the 40s, it was people like Nelson Mandela, Oliver Reginald Tambo, who were the ones who, set, who, who energized the ANC and turned it into a more sort of action-related organization. In the, in the 70s, it was people like Steve Biko who set up the con Black Consciousness Movement who energized the minds of young people, who said to young people, be proud of what you are. Be young, gifted, and black. And be proud of who you are. And in 76, it was young people, and I want you to stand on their shoulders. It was the young people of 76 who changed the trajectory of this country, who said enough is enough. They are the ones who led the uprising in Soweto and throughout the country. I want you to be like them, to say enough is enough. We are going to take this country forward. We are going to make sure that this country becomes a prosperous South Africa. And Today you have the opportunity. You have an organization like the ANC Youth League. It is the only youth formation in the country that is chanting the interests of young people. And it is the only one that is really mobilizing young people to go out and vote in their millions. And today I say, on the 29th, do go out and vote in your millions, go and tell the others that we as young people must take this country forward. It is your country, it is your responsibility, it is your chance, it is your opportunity, it is your destiny to take South Africa forward. Go and do it on the 29th. Thank you very much.